All right, chapter 44, Connective Tissue Disorders. So this is a pretty heavy chapter. Um, got some good slides here, jam-packed full of information, but I'll probably still pull you back into your book as well. So let's just get going. I'm going to do a little something different here. So I'm going to ask you a question first. So who is more at risk for connective tissue disease? Now you can be thinking about this um, as I go through the chapter. A teenage girl who swims, a 30-year-old woman who plays tennis, a 35-year-old male golfer, or a 40-year-old male computer analyst. So we're just going to think about that as we go through this chapter, and then I'll tell you the answer at the end. A little something different. All right, so connective tissue. So connective tissue disorders affect, as I said in the previous intro, bones, ligaments, cartilage, tendons. Important to know. It's also important to know what their role is. So the primary role of connective tissue is to provide protection. Protection. Whoa, look at this. Osteoarthritis. So it starts on page 60, 659. So I did try to, oops, that's my eyesight. Okay, it, it's 8, 859. I'm sorry. I have to change that. Um, so it tried to put the page numbers on here. Hopefully I put it right. Know that they're all start with an eight, right? Um, but f following into the book as well as looking at the chapters will be very helpful. Um, I've got a lot of information on both places. So uh, the pathophysiology of osteo bone arthritis inflammation um, is characterized by the degeneration of articular cartilage with hypertrophy of the underlying and adjacent bone. So signs and symptoms would be many people with osteoarthritis have no symptoms, but others have pain ranging from mild to severe. The pain is what usually brings the patient to the healthcare provider. Pain is commonly associated with activity but relieved by rest. So osteoarthritis is the most common type of arthritis affecting about 30 million Americans, sometimes called degenerative joint disease or wear and tear arthritis. It most frequently occurs in the hands, hips, and knees. The cartilage and bones within a joint begin to break down and then that hurts because it's bone on bone and it can be very painful. So medical diagnosis <clears throat> is based on, usually based on health history and radiographic studies. Medical treatment, the medical treatment regimen can include physical measures, education, drug therapy, and surgery. For some patients, diet and counseling are indicated. Now we talked about drug therapy in the last chapter. So although drug therapy is not curative, the pain of osteoarthritis can usually be controlled with non-opioid analgesics, such as acetaminophen or Tylenol, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So let me just see if there's anything else here I'd like to talk about. So the cartilage and bones within a joint begin to break down, causing pain, stiffness, and swelling, resulting in disability. These changes usually develop slowly and get worse over time. People who are obese have, or who have poor posture or who experience occupational stress are at greatest risk for the disease. The most common source of major disability is osteoarthritis of the knee. So you'll see a lot of knee replacements. It causes degeneration of the articular cartilage. And osteoarthritis may be classified as primary or secondary. 
depending on the cause. So I'm just going to look in the book and be sure there's nothing that we missed on this slide. So I see um, what I'd like to add to the slide here is that uh, the pathophysiology, normally the articular cartilage provides a smooth surface for one bone to glide over another. The cartilage transfers the weight of one bone to another so the bones don't shatter. Now this is in your book on page 857. Also under osteoarthritis on page 857, it talks about the most, it most frequently occurs in hands, hips, and knees, and I know I said that, but it's important to know, the cartilage and bones within a joint begin to break down, and that causes stiffness and swelling and res can result in a major disability. Uh, people who are obese, have poor posture, occasional stress, occupational stress, sorry, are at greatest risk for the disease. So the primary or secondary? Uh, primary osteoarthritis occurs with aging, is generally considered to be primary, and may have a genetic basis. So we can see the cultural consideration box where it says uh, osteoarthritis of the hips is more common among people who live in Japan and Saudi Arabia. That's interesting. Secondary osteoarthritis may be associated with trauma, infection, congenital deformities, corticosteroid therapy, and a variety of other conditions, including diabetes and obesity. The incidence of arthritis uh, increases with age, so people older than 50 are most often affected. So going along with, uh, I agree with all those signs and symptoms there. Medical diagnosis is good. Uh, diagnosis is made with the radiographs that like an MRI, ultrasound, arthroscopy. The synovial fluid may be aspirated for the presence of leukocytes, checking for elevated uh, sed rate or rheumatoid factor. Those are some blood tests that are done for osteoarthritis. And if there's no white cells in the synovial fluid, then that's a good thing. You can also check the sed rate and uh, rheumatoid factor and the ANA. No known cure exists for osteoarthritis, but you can make the patient more comfortable. And that would be giving the patient the medication continuously. Uh, you don't need, they're not going to get addicted to uh, these particular drugs. So giving them around the clock or on a routine basis helps. Also, um, if you, as far as physical measures, um, exercise should be followed by periods of rest during the day but not bed rest. Don't let them stay in bed all the time because it just gets worse and the patient gets stiffer. Sometimes moist heat helps and occasionally cold can be used to relieve pain. You can use a TENS unit. It could be used for the pain to stimulate. Uh, it's an electrical nerve stimulation device. Drug therapy, we talked about corticosteroid injections, as well as uh, the medication. And then the arthrocentesis, which is in your book on page 859. That's where the joint fluid is aspirated. And sometimes that, that excess fluid can ease pain and swelling, removing excess pain. Excess fluid can relieve pain. And then there is surgical treatment. So we're going to go on. So nursing care of the patient with osteoarthritis. So after a hip replacement, and we're going to go to guidelines on box 44.1. So why don't we just do that right now? Because it's kind of important. 
that is guidelines for a total hip replacement. So let's look at them. So turn to page uh, 862, box 44.1. Under hip replacement, do not, you're going to get these patients. Okay, hip replacements is very common in a long-term care facility or short-term care, short-term rehab. Um, don't flex the hip more than 90 degrees. Avoid flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Place a large pillow between the patient's legs when turning the patient, when the patient's supine, and when the patient is lying on the unaffected side. Now this is important. Advise the patient not to cross their legs. And you're going to see that a lot. You'll walk in to see your patient and they've got their legs crossed. Now, if they have a hip replacement, you need to um, uncross them. I would do this a lot to my patients because even patients with vascular problems, patients back from any kind of surgery, don't want them to get a blood clot. So patients should keep their feet uncrossed. Um, not put on shoes or socks. That's pretty important too. Don't tie shoes. They shouldn't be tying their own shoes. You can add that under four, number four there because you're advising the patient not to cross their legs, uh, not to put on their own shoes, socks, or stockings for six weeks to two months or as directed by the surgeon. And they should not tie their own shoes either. Apply leg adductor splints as ordered. Do not turn on the operative side unless specifically ordered to do so by the surgeon. Now, you know, sometimes who turns the patient? Well, it might be the CNA. So be sure the CNA is aware of these orders also. So arrange, now this is important because this could be when they go home, arrange for a raised toilet seat to allow toileting without extreme, extreme hip flexion. It could be at the facility or it could be when they go home. Permit weight bearing only as ordered. Now the doctor will say one toe touch, total foot touch the ground. Whatever he says, maybe no toe touch. So those will be the orders. No toe touching, one toe touch, or then they can touch or weight bear. And that has to be ordered. And it depends on the type of prosthesis used and whether cement was used when they did the surgery. So that's important on the hip replacement. So I'm going to go back now to impaired mobility. So where's impaired mobility? Well, you know where I want to go now? I, I see the slide here and I see where we're going. But before I go there, I want to take you to another place. And that's the patient teaching for osteoarthritis on page 861. So this is important because um, this is the patient teaching all these things. I'll let you read them yourself, um, push or slide heavy objects, wear shoes with low heels, avoid stairs when possible, sit rather than stand, high stools while sitting at a counter. I thought that was an interesting one. High chair, higher, higher chairs, not a high chair, higher chairs when sitting at a counter, uh, higher chairs rather than a low sofa. So, I found this interesting. Analgesics are used more effectively if taken routinely as prescribed rather than only when you have pain. So you get that continuous blood level of pain relievers. So you don't have an up and down because sometimes when pain gets so bad, it's hard to get a hold of it. And so just take it continuously um, so that they don't develop any pain. So now I see we're going to impaired mobility, and that's on page 862, because it's talking about the CPM machine. And there's a really good picture in your book on page 863 of the CPM machine. 
And you'll see this a lot in your rehab facilities. So the CPM machine is, stands for Continuous Passive Motion. This device moves the joints through a set range of motion at a set rate of movements per minute. The movement prevents formation of scar tissue and promotes flexibility of the new joint. So it starts out with little movements and then they get bigger. Now, some patients don't like this, right? This movement of the leg back and forth, but you just need to explain to them what the purpose is. It's to prevent stiffness. It's to keep and prevent scar tissue and promotes flexibility. So it's really important patient teaching with your nursing care will help the patient understand why they're getting this particular um, piece of machinery. So it prevents scar tissue and promotes flexibility of the joint. Um, another thing really important always after surgery is inadequate circulation. So watch for DVTs. It's the most serious post-op complication of hip and knee placement surgeries, knee replacement surgeries. Signs and symptoms we know of DVT include tenderness, swelling, redness, warmth, firm palpable blood vessels called cords. Monitor body areas distal to the operative joint, distal to the joint. So that would be pedal, post-tibial. Um, for circulatory adequacy for collecting data about skin temperature, color, and pulses. So to reduce the risk of DVT, antiembolic stockings are usually ordered, the pneumonic compression devices, uh, sometimes they'll do an anticoagulant drug. So do not place pillows or pads under the legs, that's pretty important, uh, preventing DVT. But remember then, that if they are on blood thinners or just because they've just had surgery, they are at risk for hemorrhage. So check the dressings and wound drainage for increased bleeding. Now, here we go. What is a sign of increased bleeding? That would be hypovolemia, right? They're losing body fluid. So tachycardia, hypotension, so you're going to get the hypotension, the tachycardia is a rebound trying to protect the output of the heart. Also, restlessness and anxiety can be a sign that something's wrong. When someone's restless, something's wrong. You've got to find out, play detective, find out what it is. Oxygen, is it bleeding? Check their vital signs, their O2 sat. So, um, their mentation, check all of those things. So another thing that's interesting is they're at risk for fat embolus. So whenever you're dealing with a joint, especially hip, you're at risk for a fat embolus. And that produces signs of local cerebral blood vessel occlusion. In other words, you'll get petechiae, those pinpoint hemorrhages in the upper chest and conjunctiva. Fat globules in the urine, headache, irritability, confusion, and loss of consciousness. So that's interesting. That's on page 863 if you wanted to know where I was reading that from. Um, monitor their sensation distal to the joint. So not only the pulses, but their sensation so that there's no nerve damage. And if you notice anything that's not right, anything abnormal, um, any signs of impairment, you need to report that to the surgeon. Okay, good. And of course, we're always gonna watch for potential um, for infection. And that would be temperature elevation if you get a blood count, a CBC, you'll have a WBC and you can check that white count. Um, watch for redness, swelling, warmth, foul smelling drainage. And they might need antibiotics. Okay, next one, rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a lot of words, I know that. 
um, starts on page bottom of 863 is where this oh I did again eight I put 663 I'll change that I'm sorry it's 863 it's my eyes they're bad and, and you can see why look at these little letters these little words all right so rheumatoid arthritis the disease can occur at any time but has a peak onset of people 30 to 60 years of age and it's more common in women than men you're going to find a lot of these things more common in women uh, connective tissue disease all right um, there's no single cause of RA it's considered an autoimmune disorder so autoimmune diseases are common in women So some proposed triggers for RA are antigens in the patient's system, viruses or bacteria, autoimmune, destroying yourself, genetic predisposition, environment, hormones, smoking can be a factor. So some signs and symptoms, um, the most common symptom of RA is pain in the affected joint that is aggravated by movement. Morning sniff stiffness lasting more than one hour is almost always a feature of RA, unlike the stiffness of osteoarthritis, which is relieved within minutes. Other symptoms include weakness, easy fatigue ability, anorexia, weight loss, muscle aches and tenderness and warmth and swelling of the affected joint joint changes are usually symmetric meaning that the same joints in both extremities are affected simultaneously so it's really important to know some of that information in pathophysiology. Uh, one thing, if you'll note in your book, where it says onset of the disease symptoms is characterized by synovitis or inflammation of the synovial joints. So go down there a little bit and it says, it's talking about the fibrous tissue that invades um, the panis converting it first to rigid scar tissue and then bony tissue these changes and this is where it's important these changes result in ankylosis which is a loss of joint mobility other than joint effects RA can be manifested in rheumatoid nodules diminished lacrimal and salivary secretion so what does that mean well, diminished lacrimal is your eye, your eye ducts, your tear ducts. So your eyes get dry. That goes along with rheumatoid arthritis. I know it can also go along with aging, but this go together. So whenever they have dry eye, eye drops is always a good thing to use. So if they have, um, the RA, rheumatoid arthritis, they can get decreased, they can get eye dryness, and you can put eye drops in there, in their eye. Okay, um, anything else I want to add here? We talked about medical treatment. And uh, I just want to say one more thing here where it talks about drug therapy on your slide. It talks about drug therapy is aimed at controlling the local inflammatory process and providing symptomatic relief. Five types of medications are used to treat RA, NSAIDs, steroids or corticosteroids, methotrexate and other traditional disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs like DMARDs, biologic response modifiers that are a subset of DMARDs and those are all in that previous chapter under the drugs and Janus 
kinase inhibitors. Now, the last choice of those drugs might be glucocorticoids because they have so many side effects. So uh, glucocorticoids, and it says in your book, uh, systemic glucocorticoids are used to control inflammation initially, but they are gradually reduced to the lower effective dose because of all the side effects. It also says patients on glucocorticoid therapy should receive biphosphonates to prevent osteoporosis. Very interesting. I just want to say before we go on to osteoporosis that heat and rest are, uh, that heat is really good. Always uh, when joints hurt, heat is a good thing to apply. Um, also, when we talked about uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol, do you remember the amount of Tylenol that can be given in a 24-hour period? Well, it's now three grams or 3,000 milligrams. You'll probably see that on an NCLEX question. But you as a nurse giving meds, you have to always be sure in a 24-hour period that your patient does not get Tylenol, uh, more than 3,000 milligrams of Tylenol in a 24-hour period. Now, Tylenol can hide in Vicodin. It can be hiding in Tylenol with coating. Well, that's not very hidden, is it? But it can be in a lot of different meds, so just be sure you total it all up. And remember, um, they can only have three grams in a 24-hour period, so uh, be wary of giving more than that, because it can harm their liver. Tylenol can harm their liver. We don't want that. All right, let's move on to osteoporosis. Risk factors are on page 868. If you'll turn to that page. Uh, at the greatest risk are older women who have small frames, who are Caucasian or Northern European heritage, and who have fair skin and blonde or red hair. Whoop, well, there I go. I got it. Uh, other risk factors are estrogen deficiency, physical inactivity, low body weight, inadequate calcium, protein, or vitamin D. So osteoporosis, you gotta really be careful in the aging uh, category women have a greater chance of getting it than men and of course um, like i mentioned the calcium and the vitamin d you can get that in diet so diet with increased calcium is important uh, when there's a risk factor of inadequate calcium so calcium in the diet is preferred much preferred over a pill So signs and symptoms of osteoporosis may include back pain, fractures, loss of height. So that's why we're going to always do a height when we admit patients. Uh, you know, I know you can't stand them up probably, maybe, and get a height measurement. They just don't have that kind of a scale. If they do, that's great. You can do it that way. Otherwise, you could use a tape measure or you can ask the patient. But the patient will tell you that their height is probably what it was like years ago. So it's good to get an accurate height. But loss of height is a symptom uh, because of the vertebral compression and kyphosis. Kyphosis is hunchback, right? They tend to bend over because as those bones soften and if they don't stand erect and have good posture, they're going to start hunching over and that's kyphosis. That's another really good word to know. All right. Um, medical diagnosis. A variety of non-invasive tools can be used to assess bone mineral density, like the DEXA scan. That's the best accurate and precise diagnostic study. And that can check the spine, hip, 
radius finger, the radial arm, uh, finger, and total body. Okay, medical treatment. Medical treatment is aimed at preventing fractures and stimulating bone formation. There are bone stimulators. Some types of osteoporosis drugs slow bone breakdown, and you can look at those medications. Um, Fosamax, remember uh, Fosamax, and be sure that you remember how to take Fosamax. There's also some that spur new bone growth. Uh, nursing care, when starting your physical exam for osteoporosis, always start with inspection. So see the picture there, uh, how the person's erect and then kind of hunched over. See their height difference, the kyphosis. So this you can see how uh, the aging process um, and the osteoporosis affects the body. Now, there is a surgery. So let's say a patient has a spinal fracture because you know you can fall and get fractures, right? Hips, knees, arms, hands, trying to wrist when you try to catch yourself from falling. Um, but back surgery is very common. Uh, laminectomy, where they take out a lamina or part of the, the spine, one of the spinal bones. They can also do fusions. Um, and it talks about this on page 869. Patients who have spinal fractures caused by osteoporosis may be considered for vertebroplasty an outpatient procedure in which bone cement is injected into a cracked or broken vertebrae. This is a pretty cool surgery because the patient can get out of the hospital really quickly. After the cement hardens, it stabilizes the fractures and supports the spine. This can relieve pain, increase mobility, and reduce the use of pain medicines. Um, also, there's kyphoplasty. Is a similar procedure in which balloons are inserted into the vertebra to create spaces that are filled with cement. And this procedure helps to correct spinal deformity and restore lost height. Now there's another one uh, called a laminectomy, and that's where they remove the lamina in the spine. And they'll replace that maybe with a, um, it can be a man-made type of, uh, piece of bone or it can be bone from a donor bone of course that would be from a deceased person um, and if they do have a laminectomy or back surgery they should be rolled a side roll every two hours so you would need somebody to help roll the patient after back surgery um, two people so that the patient rolls in one constant roll. Keep that spine straight. Okay. Anything else? I don't think so. Let's move to the next. Gout. Ah, oh, gout. That starts at the bottom of page 869. It's an inflammatory arthritis caused by sudden severe attacks, characterized by sudden severe attacks of pain, redness, and tenderness in the joints, especially the joint at the base of the big toe. That's the common one I can remember in cartoons where the big toe was always throbbing, literally, like big and throbbing. But that's the way it feels. I mean, it can be so bad and come on so suddenly that you can be walking across the street. I actually, uh, my father-in-law, this happened to him. He was walking across the street and he just like, ah, and like he thought he was having a heart attack because he was in such severe pain, couldn't even walk. Well, it was his gout that was acting up. So it can come on really quickly, be a little bit scary at first. Um, 
but it's something that happens. It's very painful. Uh, even putting the blankets over a patient's toe can be painful. It's so, so sensitive. Uh, the risk increases with hyperuricemia, obesity, and a high intake of alcohol, red meat, and fructose. So if you turn the page, it also talks about um, some signs and symptoms. Trauma, diur uh, diuretics, increased alcohol consumption, high purine diet. So when a patient has a high purine diet, so that's like uh, seafood, that can bring on an attack. So patients with a gout should avoid shrimp. And I think it talks about that. Um, over on page 872, it says purine content of selected foods. And you'll notice that fish under moderate purine content has fish and shellfish. And also other things are mussels and scallops. So just avoid a seafood platter, right? People with gout, they just, seafood, they, they suffer after they eat that. So you know. Okay, so let's go back to the slide here. Uh, so gout is characterized by hyperuricemia or excess uric acid in the blood that occurs because of excessive production or decreased excretion. So they either produce too much or they don't excrete the uric acid by the kidneys. The result is an accumulation of uric crystals in and around the joints. When crystals are deposited, painful inflammation known as gouty arthritis results. Now, let me just stop here for a second and say, think about this. So you've got decreased excretion of uric acid by the kidneys or excess production. So the kidneys are involved in gout, aren't they? So kidneys are involved. And if you've got crystals in your, in your um, arthritis or in your gout, crystals, then you might get crystals as stones or kidney stones too. So remember that you can get kidney stones with gout as well. And I do think that uh, talks about that in your book on page 871 under impaired fluid balance. It says monitor that these patients should drink eight to 16, eight ounce, eight to 16. Wow, that's a lot. Eight ounce cups of fluid daily unless contraindicated if they have heart failure or other reason not to have that much fluid. Also, go down a little bit. It says monitor intake and urine output and promptly report signs and symptoms of urinary stones, which is characterized by pain in the flank, which is your side, lower abdomen or genitals, fever, hematuria, so blood in the urine, decreased urine output because the urine can't get past the stones. That's why it's decreased urine output. So you have to be sure to let the registered nurse know. So you think, oh, gout, not a big deal, but it can be because it has all these side effects. The pain, the unusual pain, uh, the can't eat seafood, then the fluid balance and the stones with the, the kidneys. So it affects a lot of different things. So I want you to, while we're on page 871, look at the picture also of the hand. And it has these things called tophi. So these are typical appearance of tophi, which may occur in chronic gout on an index finger. They're little bumps. So patients with advanced gout have tophi. That's interesting, isn't it? All right, so uh, also on that page 871, you have the patient teaching with the gout where it talks about animal protein. So even steak, 
limited stake, just limited, and alcohol. Okay, and then we know we need to avoid a sea flu platter. Okay, let's move on to something else. Systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. My very first patient as a student nurse had scleroderma. And it totally freaked me out because this lady's skin was so tight because that's what scleroderma is. It's sclerosing of the derma or the skin. And it was tight across her chest and she had trouble breathing. And it also gets kind of pulled across the nose so the skin across their nose is um, shiny. That, that was my experience as a student nurse, one of my first patients. So systemic sclerosis is commonly called scleroderma. Even though no cure exists, treatment with immunosuppressive like methotrexate, cyclophosamide, and antifibrotic drugs like uh, So it's an autoimmune disease of unknown origin. And as I said, it takes its name from characteristic hardening of the skin. Uh, when it's confined to the skin and muscles, it's usually uh, relatively mild and is called localized scleroderma. Signs and symptoms, uh, systemic sclerosis is thought to be the result of environmental factors and genetic susceptibility. Environmental factors that may serve as triggers include infectious agents, occupational, dietary, medical, and lifestyle exposures. So I also want to say here that there's a few other things that can occur. And that is a uh, right under systemic sclerosis where it says scleroderma is a chronic autoimmune disease. Uh, down at the very bottom where it says crest syndrome consists of five features. So these are things that can go along with scleroderma. Calcinosis or calcium deposits in the tissues, Raynaud phenomenon, and that's where your fingers um, turn white. I have that, I have the uh, Raynaud phenomenon. And if I go into a grocery store, even when I'm here at school, I, I got it earlier today. Uh, one finger, it turned totally white. It gets numb and tingly, painful. Uh, I had to put nitroglycerin cream on it and then it turned blue. So it was white, blue, and then it gets red. So it's called the red, white, and blue disease. That's Raynaud's uh, Raynaud phenomenon. It's due to vascular spasms. I just threw that in, by the way. It's nothing you have to know, but you'll, you'll learn about it probably later in a different chapter. Um, esophageal dysfunction, sclerodactyl, which is scleroderma of the digits, and telangiectasias, which are dilated superficial blood vessels, telangiectasias. Okay, if they do have um, the swallowing problem under inadequate nutrition, it says um, if the patient has esophageal involvement, suggest small frequent meals, here we go again, and they're tolerated better. Relaxing environment before and after food, uh, before and after meals. Spicy foods, alcohol, and caffeine are discouraged because they stimulate gastric secretions. Because esophageal reflux is common, a proton pump inhibitor might be ordered to reduce the risk of esophagitis. Now just think, as a nurse, and you have a patient who gets esophagitis or reflux and they're not on a proton pump inhibitor or they're not on anything for their stomach, that's something you can notify the physician and get relief for the patient because you know they only see the patient every 30 days and they may not know about reflux they may not know the patient's 
having symptoms. So that's something that you need to let the doctor know if they're not on anything. And also, since we just talked about this, um, if that medication they're on isn't working, you need to let them know that too, because there's many to choose from. Proton H2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, and there's all different kinds. So if it, one doesn't work, maybe another one will. But you'll never know if you don't tell the doctor. Okay, let's move on to derma, dermatomyositis. So we're, now we're on page 874, and you can see the picture of the lady and her hands, and that is a systemic sclerosis, that's scleroderma, that's kind of how they look. All right, so let's talk about derma. Dermatomyositis, myo muscle, right? Itis, inflammation. So it's applied to the condition when no skin involvement exists, and the term dermomyositis is used when a characteristic skin rash occurs. A no known cause, but conditions frequently seen in patients with scleroderma, RA, vasculitis, lupus, or sojourn symptom. Um, also on this page is patient teaching for the sclerosis, systemic sclerosis, and that's to prevent vasospasm or that Raynaud syndrome. Keep your hands warm and reduce stress and exhaustion. So um, I always wear gloves when I go to the grocery store. I know that's kind of weird, but when I go through the freezer section, my hands will go into a vasospasm and I get that white, red, white, blue problem. And it is uncomfortable. I always have hot heat warmers for my hands too. That's a good thing to have. All right, so the major activity, excuse me, the major activity producing pathology in polymyositis is infiltration of inflammatory cells causing destruction of muscle fibers. Inflammation of tissues surrounding blood vessels is an outstanding pathologic feature of the disease. Condition is sometimes associated with malignancies. So these are relatively rare acute inflammatory diseases that primarily affect the skeletal muscle. Okay. All right. So basically I read you everything. Uh, how do we diagnose this though? So medical diagnosis is made by a muscle biopsy. And we talked about that in the previous chapter where we talked about um, different procedures that are done. Muscle biopsy that's positive for muscle degeneration, elevated muscle enzymes, and myopathic electromyographic changes. So that would diagnose the polymyositis of the dermato myositis. Okay, there's a couple more things. So let's go to the next slide. So there's other connective tissue disorders. So you can look at nutrition considerations for connective tissue disorders. You can read through that. But I want to get down to table 44.1. Bursitis. So what is bursitis? Well, it's an inflammation of the bursa, which is the bony, uh, excuse me, the fluid-filled sac that cushions bony prominences, so bursitis. So go to management now, and this is important because once pain resolves, progressive range of motion such as walking the fingers of the affected arm up the wall is helpful. So that's just, that's a, something they do in physical therapy, but it's something they can do um, on their own as well. You don't need someone telling you to do that. You just need to know that that's a, a good range of motion exercise for bursitis. Another one is carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm sure you've all heard of that. 
is a common condition in which the median nerve in the wrist becomes compressed. A lot of computer people get that, people who work on the computer a lot. Maybe you even have signs and symptoms of pain and numbness in the palmar side of the fingers and the weakness of the thumb. So go to management. How do we manage that? Splinting. Splinting to prevent flexion and hyperextension. You can also do glucocorticoid injections if you like that kind of thing. I don't, but injections are helpful. And then you can also have surgical release of the carpal ligament because that ligament gets tight over the carpal uh, ligament. So the carpal, so it's like a tunnel, carpal tunnel, and then the ligament gets tight over it. All right, post-op, you would assess color and temperature of the hand, notify the surgeon of pallor, cyanosis, or numbness. But splinting helps carpal tunnel, and then walking your fingers up the wall helps with bursitis once the pain is relieved. All right, there is another thing. Uh, well, there's the pyomyalgia, pyomyalgia rheumatica, Rider syndrome, Bosset syndrome, Sojourn syndrome. So I can tell you what those are. They are in your book. So let's look. On the next page, uh, table 44.1 on the next page, Rider syndrome is a connective tissue disease. It's reactive arthritis. Bassett syndrome is uh, signs and symptoms, chronic systemic autoimmune syndrome. See how many times I've said autoimmune? Oral and genital ulcers, eye inflammation. Uh, Sojourn syndrome, you don't need to know these, but it's interesting, isn't it? Interesting to know all these connective tissue disorders exist. Sojourn syndrome, you might see that pop up sometimes because it's a syndrome, it's not a disease. So it, it will pop up just like um, the, uh, oh, now I forgot. Oh, well, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, Sojourn Syndrome, um, it's an inflammatory disease that obstructs secretory ducts in the eyes, mouth and vagina. Uh, dry eyes, so this referred back to one of our arthritis where you got dry eye. So you wanna give eye drops. All right, you can read through a patient with total hip replacement because this could happen. You might have a patient like that. There's also that party polyarteritis nodosa. I want to say one more thing. Um, so you know about lupus, right? It's an autoimmune disorder also. So it's called SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. I'm not sure that it mentioned it in, the, in this chapter, so I wanna bring it up because it's important to know. It's on page 575, I did look it up for you. Um, it's an autoimmune disorder. Um, I have a friend who has lupus and she stay, cannot go out in the sun. So like when we go shopping at Macy's or whatever, she always parks underneath the awning at Macy's because she doesn't walk out in the sun because she's very sensitive to the sun. So it also affects joints, which is why I wanna bring it up here because we're talking about joints. 
So it ties in, but it really didn't talk about it anywhere. It's autoimmune and it affects the joints. So it should have been here, but it's not. Um, but you may see it mentioned. So lupus patients need to stay out of the sun and it is an autoimmune disorder that affects the joints. So that's important for you to know. Okay, now, what are we gonna do next? Well, we're gonna find out if you know the answer to this question. Do you remember the question? <laughs> Probably not, right? That was like ages ago. So the question was, which patient is most likely to develop a connective tissue di disease? And your options were a teenage girl who swims, so that word teenage, throw it out because it's a woman that we're talking about. A 30-year-old woman who plays tennis, that's B. A 35-year-old male golfer, well, it's specific to men, right? Connective tissue disorders um, are usually affect more women than men. So since we have the choice of a woman here, we're going to choose a woman. So the other answer was a 35-year-old male golfer and a 40-year-old male computer analyst. So those were your four choices. So the answer is B, because women have a greater chance than men of developed connective tissue disease. Wasn't that fun? All right, thanks.